Hey everyone, I just wanted to get back and uh, finish up with chapter 15 on pest management. So here I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so we left off talking about um, the issues of monocultures. And uh, most of our field crops are grown as monocultures. So again, think of this as kind of an all you can eat buffet. Whenever we have pests, um, problems in monocultures, they tend to be big problems. So again, it's best to focus on prevention here. Um, or you can also think about planting a polyculture, multiple crops together. Um, one issue with the crawling and pests, insects, mites, etc., is that they don't only um, pose the hazard of just doing damage directly to the crop, they also pose the damage of potentially introducing and spreading disease amongst crops and uh, also livestock too. So um, when we talk about controlling pests after you've already got a, a big outbreak, um, it's important to have a little bit of context about the history. So the first organic pesticides, and I say organic not in terms of organically approved or um, OMRI, which is the organic material review list. Um, I say organic here, I'm talking about based on a combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the organic molecules. Um, so synthetic organic pesticides were um, first developed for use uh, shortly after World War II. And you have to think about how that happened. A lot of these chemicals were being studied um, for the war effort and uh, they were diverted after the war to uh, be used in agriculture. Um, kind of fascinating that that's how it happened, but um, many of them, including DET, were amongst this class of pesticides that really kind of fueled the uh, green revolution an explosion of population post-World War II. Um, they are cheaply produced and they do have a great ability to kill a wide variety of insects and mites. And we're talking about insecticides and miticides anyway. Um, however, over time, a lot of these pesticides, um, especially if they are per persistent pesticides, they will allow um, these pests to build up resistance, which then um, their use becomes less effective and their negative impacts on the environment um, can pose a much more significant problem. So we have that issue because again, um, pests have many more generations usually, especially insects and mites, than our crops do. So they can much better adapt, especially when a pesticide is persistent. Whenever we control any kind of pests, we want to think about how it got there and also really weigh and diagnose the issue to see if it really truly is a problem. Only, I mean, less than 1% of pests of insects, I should say, are truly pests. In fact, most insects provide essential services and benefits to ecosystems and to agriculture. So keep that in mind. We don't want to just kill everything. Um, there are many uh, harmless species of insects and mites out there that are actually predators and they kill the bad bugs. So we want to keep those alive as much as possible. And that's why I think, one of the reasons why I think we should use um, chemicals as a last resort. Um, think about our pollinators, honeybees, butterflies. Um, it's said that over half of our food crops are pollinated by these insects. Um, so we need them to ensure good fruit production. Um, some of them also provide good secondary products and um, butterflies, for instance, get ecotourism out of them. 
we want to talk a little bit about uh, host resistance, and this is a, a big key factor in preventing pests in the first place. And I, I think I said it before, and I'll say it again, that a well-grown um, plant, a healthy plant, is a strong plant, and it's resistant to attack by insects and mites on its own to a certain degree. Um, especially in nature. We take them out of nature and we, we put them into an altered ecosystem, then we do have more issues associated with that because we've kind of removed some of their natural defenses. Um, and we've, in creating a optimal environment for the hosts, we've also created an optimal environment for the pest as well. So just keep in mind that a healthy plant um, does discourage attack from insects and mites naturally. Another way to control insects and mites is by using uh, biological control. Those beneficial insects that have some sort of relationship with our pest species, usually that they either are eating them or parasitizing them. Um, so here, uh, just a couple of examples here. Um, on the right, we have a uh, green lacewing larva. And most of these insects, it's when they're in their larval stage that they're doing um, most of the feeding, especially on the smaller insects here. Um, so in this image, this uh, green lacewing larva is eating uh, scale insects, which can be a big problem, especially in greenhouse production. On the left here, we have a species of lady bird beetle uh, similar to a ladybug that is eating aphids. Um, so th there's lots of these um, excellent biological controls out there, and it's, it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with them because these two don't necessarily look familiar to you, do they? Um, and they're providing a positive, a, a benefit to us. Um, we shouldn't be reactionary and say, all right, just because I see that insect on my plant means I need to kill it. Um, figure out what the pest is doing before you uh, jump the gun and, and you know, spray chemical on it um, or any other kind of control, really. Don't spend your money in, until you know that it is actually a major problem. All right, let's talk about con cultural control of insects and mites. And um, one very simple one is just by planting your crop at the time where it is least susceptible, or maybe even when um, that insect pest is not present. And one of the examples that I think of uh, most often for this planting time is um, your cabbage worms. Um, very um, significant pests of any brassicas, things like cabbage and kale and broccoli, and they blend in. It's actually the larva of the white sulfur butterfly, um, also called the cabbage moth, but it lays its eggs on any kind of brassica, and when it hatches, these little green worms that are, are very small and blend in with the foliage uh, start eating holes in the leaves. If you plant these crops, which most of them are um, fairly cold hardy, if you plant them really early or really late in the season, uh, kind of early in the spring or late in the fall, then um, these pests aren't as likely to be active and attack them. Um, they can withstand the cold temperatures, but the pest can't. So that's one simple uh, strategy. Um, the one they talk about a lot in the book is planting uh, wheat after the fly free date of the Hessian fly um, to allow it to escape infestation. We talk about physical and mechanical controls. Um, we kind of need to target these specific to the pest, um, but there are lots of different things that we can do going from leaving fields fallow or practicing crop rotation. Um, screening your seed beds um, or ventilators on a greenhouse so that uh, these pests can't get in there. Um, could be cultivation, um, destroying the habitat of the pests. Could also just be hand picking these insect pests. 
um, of course, doesn't work on the smaller stuff. Um, a stream of water can dislodge a lot of the insects and mites as well. Um, spider mites, for instance, they hate really humid areas. So constant misting or a spray of water can do uh, dislodge a lot of them and um, can really reduce some of the damage. Um, on this next one, picking up and or destroying fallen fruit, I think that goes along with any kind of, um, you know, just crop maintenance, just pruning of dead and dying foliage as well as fruit. All of this kind of goes into the prevention of the habitat of the pest in the first place, which will go a long ways. Um, again, an, an ounce of prevention is worth, in many cases, far more than a pound of cure. When we talk about insects, it's important to have a little bit of context on their you know, kind of organization, their classification as an organism. So insects are in the phylum Arthropoda and the arthropods are basically anything that has a jointed appendage and also has an exoskeleton. Um, so within that class or within that phylum um, are the classes arachnid, uh, crustaceans, the kilopods, which are like centipedes, the decapods, which are millipedes, and of course, insects. So these are all kind of in that um, phylum, but each of these classes um, are fairly different. And um, really, we don't have too many um, pests in the arachnid um, class other than mites. And most of the mites are actually beneficial. There are just a few species of, of pests there. Of course, ticks are an issue on humans. They're not really a, a problem on plants though. And the crustaceans, we don't really deal with any of these as pests, um, unless maybe you're in aquaculture. Um, centipedes are, are predators, so they're not pests. They're good guys, really, even though they look scary. Um, millipedes can be pests, although usually they are detritivores. They are um, mostly breaking down um, organic matter and plant matter and not actually eating live plant matter. Um, Everything in the insect um, class, um, I, that's where we have most of our pests. Not everything is a pest though. A, a fair, a, actually the majority of insects are not pests. So a, a very small percentage of, the, of them are classified as pest species, but they're perhaps at this, the most recognizable and most damaging of at least the arthropods. So we take that class, Insecta, and we break it down into a um, couple dozen orders. And amongst those orders, there are uh, many different families, uh, genera, and over a million species of insects. Actually, over 80% of all of the species of animals known on Earth are in the class Insecta. Pretty crazy. Again, most of these insects are of no economic importance. Um, less than five of them have any direct importance to humans and only about 1% or less than that regularly reach pest status. When I say pest status, I mean, that's what pest managers would, they meet the economic threshold for them to be considered a pest, meaning that they do a significant amount of damage to crops on a uh, annual basis. Just real quickly looking at the insect orders, and I think it's important to know the orders and be able to recognize what is in each order, kind of in a general sense, just so that you can better diagnose and identify them. So Coleoptera are the beetles and weevils, and this is the largest order of insects. Lepidoptera are butterflies, moths, and all their larvae, which amongst the Lepidoptera, it's really the caterpillars, their larval stage of those insects that do the damage. Um, butterflies and moths are, for the most part, good. Uh, Hymenoptera um, are mostly good guys. We got all of our bees, um, wasps, which many wasps are insect parasites, 
Um, ants can do some damage. They usually don't attack um, crops themselves. Um, they're usually aiding and abetting um, some other uh, insect villains, things like aphids or scale. Um, diptera are the flies. Heteroptera are the true bugs. Um, this is also sometimes called homoptera um, and the bug-like insects. When we're trying to identify um, insects and their relatives, we need to look at these characteristics. Um, first, insects are characterized by having, at least the adults anyway, having three um, defined body regions. The head, the thorax, which has all of its mobile parts, um, wings and legs attached, and then the abdomen, which has all of its sexual parts attached and usually digestive parts as well. Um, all insects have three pairs of jointed legs. So six legs, it's an insect. Eight legs, it's a mite, spider, or tick. Um, and very important to distinguish between those two because an insecticide isn't going to kill arachnids. Uh, arachnicide isn't going to kill insects. Um, they're sensory organs, so um, insects, its feelers or antennas. Um, compound eyes and insects. And uh, usually one or two pairs of wings, although sometimes these wings are vestigial. They're not actually used for flight. Um, they're just fixed wings. But uh, most insects do have some sort of wing, at, at least in one form of the insect at some point. Uh, all right, mites, spiders, and ticks have two main body regions. Um, the head and the thorax are fused together. And then they have the abdomen. They have four pairs of jointed legs, eight legs. They don't have antenna or wings, and they have simple instead of compound eyes. So distinguishing between those um, is important, again, because if you're going to use a pesticide on them, you have to know what it is first. Um, we also look at the metamorphosis, so how these um, animals, insects or mites, slash spiders, how they develop, um, whether they go through incomplete or complete metamorphosis, um, or whether they don't go through metamorphosis at all. So some of these life forms basically hatch out of the egg and they just grow. So the, the, the baby, the young version looks very much like a, just a smaller version of the adult. Um, so, Really, the, the main example of the pests that we have of this is thrips. Um, then we have those that undergo complete metamorphosis, and um, that includes these orders. And uh, notice that the beetles are in there, the um, flies, um, the lepidoptera, the butterflies, moths also. So, and that's probably what we think of most, the lepidoptera. It has an egg, the egg hatches, and it's this caterpillar, um, what is the larva stage, um, that then will kind of melt all its body parts down into this pupa stage where it's kind of stationary and stuck somewhere, and then it emerges into the adult. So um, the ugly caterpillar to the butterfly. Um, same thing happens with moths, beetles, and uh, flies, except with um, beetles, the larval stage is grubs, and with flies, the larval stage are um, maggots, or what we call maggots anyway. Incomplete metamorphosis is somewhat similar to no metamorphosis in that um, basically they're, they're lacking one of those life cycles, um, and usually it's the, the pupa uh, and or larval stage. So like grasshoppers, for instance, go from egg to a nymph to an adult. And the nymph can look quite a bit different than the adult, um, but it, um, you know, is still fairly similar. And it doesn't have a pupa stage or a larval stage there. Um, in the case of um, 
the dragonfly pictured here in the odonta um, order and basically go from an egg to a naiad to an adult and the naiads get closer and closer um, the wings start as kind of vestigial um, not used for flight and then until they become an adult basically and usually these are, are going to live in water first um, that's one of the things of that order uh, The other thing that we emphasize um, with insects and really how we might be able to tell um, an insect or get pretty close to it anyway, um, without actually seeing the physical presence of it is by looking at the mode of feeding or the, the damage that it is causing. Um, so that can help us kind of identify the mouth parts, which in turn can help us to identify what the insect it is. And, and most insects do have some sort of specificity, yeah, specificity if I can say that word, um, to a host. So for instance, many moths um, feed only on one family of plants. Not all of them. The one pictured here, the gypsy moth, has a wide range of hosts and defoliates lots of trees. It's actually a really bad, invasive, exotic insect. So they do this kind of chewing damage, and the larva will eat kind of from the side of the leaf from the margin and eat inward. Um, so they're, you know, eventually might eat the whole leaf. They usually um, leave that midrib, that kind of tough part of the leaf, the, the main vein of it. Um, we also have stem borers, which actually, um, usually an insect lays its eggs in a stem. And what you'll see here is like a, a trail, almost looks like sawdust um, around where it's kind of eaten inside of it, or maybe a, a trail inside the stem. Um, that's something to look at, especially the squash vine borer um, can be really bad for wide variety of squash plants and usually what you'll see is its exit wound there um, with kind of what looks like sawdust on the ground around outside of that stem. We also have piercing and sucking insects um, such as aphids and um, a lot of these kind of hang out on the underside of the leaves and they prefer kind of young um, kind of more succulent growth and basically they're gonna stick their sticker in there and then they're gonna suck the juices out of the plant. Juices have to go somewhere when they excrete them. Um, so a lot of times you'll find a sticky substance um, on the leaves below. Um, another feeder, a uh, sucker feeder is a spider mite and they make little stippling, little spots uh, on the upper side of the leaves um, from where they're feeding below. Um, so it looks like it, it just poked needle, uh, needle point throughout the leaf. Um, doesn't actually make a hole all the way through, but it's kind of lighter colored spots. So that, that's one way to distinguish spider mite damage. One of the biggest issues though with these insects, these sucking pests, is that when they do that sucking, they are actually also injecting um, potentially um, viruses and diseases, um, transmitting them, taking them from plant to plant. And we call these uh, vectors because they move them. And probably the most common uh, model for a vector is the mosquito. And of course, as it feeds on us, it sticks that needle into us and moves our blood. And then it, when it moves to the next person, it could transmits something that came out of that blood. So um, vector damage is very important and usually we have a very low tolerance for insects that cause vector damage um, because when you get a, a virus, there's not really anything you can do other than kill the plant. Um, so when we talk about using insecticides or miticides, um, we also think here about what does it do to the insect? So how does it enter um, the insect and actually kill it? So we have systemic insecticides that are entering through the mouth and then they're gonna kill it through absorption. Um, 
these can pose an issue that they the residues can remain in plant tissues and be eaten by humans. So usually we want to not apply these systemic insecticides um, close to a harvest period. We also have contact poison, which basically means that it's got to be in contact with the pest itself. You have to hit it for it to be effective. Um, we have inhalants and fumigants, um, which are similar in that basically the insect has to kind of breathe it in. We have cell, cell membrane disruptors, um, which basically cause the uh, membranes of the cells to break down and um, basically just kind of flow out, it's kind of similar to frost and plants and, and what it does to them, but it's doing it to insects. Um, basically, they, it causes them to dehydrate and um, lose, lose their good juice, pretty much. Um, whole class of insects uh, based on that as well. We have hormone disruptors, which are mimicking insect hormones and just disrupt their normal function, um, which can, um, sometimes these are really effective in preventing insects from continuing to breed. So it, it might not get rid of the insect itself, but it prevents it from having another uh, life cycle. Um, there are a, a wide variety of these though that can, can um, some of them can actually kill the insects as well. Um, we also call these insect growth regulators or IGRs. We also have pheromones, um, which kind of can disrupt mating. So similar to the hormones, except um, they're basically just confusing the insect. Or we can also use this as a bait for a trap. Um, so we usually use pheromones um, in that way, accompanied with a trap. So it attracts the uh, male or female insect to it, and then you poison it there and kill it. Uh, desiccants uh, cause, also cause them to basically uh, dehydrate. Diatomaceous earth is a um, very common organic approved um, desiccant that I often use, especially on things like the potato beetle. Um, so again, there's lots of different classes of these insecticides, and so we classify them by their mode of action, but we also classify them by the actual chemical makeup of these insecticides as well. And all of these insecticides, all pesticides, have to be approved and registered um, initially with the EPA. Um, and then from the EPA, it's regulated often by state agencies. Um, their use and their sale. Um, one of the big issues with insecticides especially is again the residues found and we have to be careful not to have those residues on the harvested portion of the plant uh, around harvest time. Uh, Got to wash them off. So there are some pretty strict regulations associated with that. All of these are usually found on the label of the insecticide or pesticide itself. So here's how we classify them by the chemistry. First, we look at the inorganic compounds. Um, inorganic compounds are um, those that are basically mostly based on heavy metals like arsenic or copper. And um, these were um, somewhat effective, but they were very toxic um, to people. So the use of these has, has been greatly reduced. There are some that are still out on the market. Um, we have biorational compounds, and most of those are um, plant or other organism extracts. Um, and a couple of these that are really popular um, for organic production, and really just in any kind of production, pyrethrum, um, rotenone, nicotine from tobacco, and um, from the neem tree, an extract from, from neem, neem oil. And there's more um, research going in and developing new biorational chemicals all the time. When we get into more synthetic compounds, we have the synthetic organic chemicals. Again, those are the ones that are based on hydrocarbons. Um, kind of the poster child 
for these synthetic organic chemicals is the chlorinated hydrocarbons, such as DDT. Um, the big issue around DDT and why it is kind of the poster child is that it was very persistent. And it was thought that it wasn't really poisonous um, or harmful to people or anything other than insects for a long time. But it's so persistent that it stuck around and it got concentrated in animal tissues and up the food chain, it got magnified to where um, it became very toxic and eventually became toxic to um, birds of prey because they're eating it, you know, being at the top of the food chain, eating a whole lot more of that chemical that's just kind of built up um, exponentially through the food chain. And that's why uh, DDT was eventually, um, its registration by the EPA was canceled and effectively it was banned. Um, we also have the organic phosphates, which are based on phosphates instead of hydrocarbons. Um, and these, most of the chlorinated hydrocarbons are, are kind of out. Um, most of them are not used anymore. There are still some out there. The organic phosphates um, decompose more rapidly in the environment, but they can still be toxic. So they do have to be used with care. A lot of those are being phased out now as well. Um, more recently, we have the carbamates and carbaryl um, was the first widely used that has low toxicity to mammals and other um, non-target insects and other organisms. Um, and it's very effective against a wide range of both sucking and chewing insects. Um, and many of these are also systemic and highly toxic. We got the pyrethroids, which is in, I guess, comparatively relatively new um, and they are mimicking the natural substance pyrethrins and also have low toxicity to non-target organisms. And they kill a broad spectrum. So they are effective. Um, they're not the safest, but um, they're much less toxic than the previously mentioned pesticides. The neonicotinoids is a, also a recent class of insecticide that you may have heard in the news. Um, they are being studied and being banned in some countries because they have been found to be very toxic to pollinators, honeybees especially. So um, they're not completely banned in the US. Um, some of them have been removed, but um, they are fairly, fairly, fairly toxic um, to the target organisms, um, mostly to insects though. They're, they have very low toxicity to um, other organisms other than insects, especially vertebrates. We also have spray oils, um, which basically you take a, a mineral oil and distill it or refine it and then use it. Um, they're not, they usually don't pose problems to plants, but they are lethal to insects. Um, we have these as synthetic organic chemicals, but we also have them as botanical oils too. So there are some organic certified um, oil insecticides out there as well. And they work by suffocating the insects. Um, we also have microbial insecticides, which carry kind of a cocktail of bacteria, fungi, viruses, um, and are also kind of interchangeable with the biorational. These would be kind of included in that class of insecticides as well. Um, more and more research going into these. And um, one of the classic examples is um, Bacillus thuringiensis, aka Bt. And um, Bt has been genetically engineered for some crops to actually produce it. So if an insect feeds on it, they get poisoned by Bt. Um, this bacteria that lives inside of the leaves. It's kind of crazy that they were able to genetically engineer that, but it's one of those uh, science fact stories. All right, let's move away from insects and talk about um, other um, organisms. Uh, the vertebrates, things that have backbones, and um, there's a lot of potential to have very damaging pests that are vertebrates, and um, these are very difficult to get rid of too. 
um, because there aren't as many pesticides out there that um, target them directly. And um, generally, they're just difficult to get rid of. So uh, rodents in general, rats, mice, they're usually mostly a uh, targeting your stored um, crops, especially grains. Um, they usually do, are not feeding on um, the plants themselves, although sometimes they will feed on, on harvested um, fruits and sometimes vegetables too. Um, but I think the biggest issue with rodents is getting into places like uh, granaries. Um, so we generally want to try to control them just before harvest begins um, and have kind of often traps, um, poisons as well. Um, again, far away from the plants and the storage itself, ideally. And try, again, trying to remove an ability for them to get in, preventing their habitat. Um, I think bait traps and um, also the killing traps too. Traps are kind of the best way to get rid of the rodents. Uh, we also have major issues with things like deer and groundhogs, rabbits, and um, all kinds of different control measures um, surrounding those. Again, I think prevention is probably the best route. So um, excluding them, preventing them from getting to your crop in the first place is, is the best thing that you can do. Um, using repellents does work. Um, this might sound graphic and gory, but personally, I think that you know actually killing them and uh, maybe spilling their blood near your crops, um, it does seem to um, repel them. So, um, if you're hunters, then you know uh, take that leftover deer blood and maybe uh, and dump it around outside, and it will discourage them from you know coming back. Um, they don't want to be around where their family members have died. Um, so anyway, the mammals it's best to exclude them in the first place. Use good, well-designed fencing um, is the best way to to prevent them. And if you do get them in. Um, really the best thing to do is to, to kill them. So um, actually, I should say here, I had a huge issue at our old farm with groundhogs and um, trapping them seemed to be the best thing that worked. But, um, and if you ever have groundhog problems, they love cantaloupe. So um, using a live trap with cantaloupe um, was a, a surefire way to attract them and trap them. Um, in the state of Virginia, if you trap an animal, um, you're supposed to kill it. You're, you're not supposed to move and re-release animals. So um, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, they have the heart traps, um, you know, they're not really um, good for use in Virginia. Um, I think you can get a license to move them, but um, it's probably far easier just to shoot them. All right, so anyway, let's get off the mammals, talk about birds. Um, and I think the, the biggest issue I've had with um, birds is actually digging out seeds that you've just planted. Um, they prefer grain crops mostly, um, some fruits, um, depending on the bird. The blackbirds seem to be the worst. Starlings, um, I hate those little things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm about to start saying some expletives there. Um, birds can also be a major menace to your crops and um, it depends on what you're growing, know what your pests are. Um, they're also very difficult to, to get rid of. On fruiting crops, the best thing to do is to put nets up, excluding birds in the first place. Um, usually they will I say birds and mammals as well. Um, they will usually get over most repellents, um, most of your tricks, most of your fences, they will eventually get through. Um, so just having the best design and I think of a, a fencing and exclusion program is um, pretty much the best way to get rid of them. Uh, scarecrows, they work, right? Um, so some of the things that people use for um, birds include the um, repellents, the scare tactics. So explosives, 
um, firecrackers, fireworks, um, amplified recordings. They're annoying, but um, they do work on birds initially anyway. Um, also having dogs, right? Having it, your dog outside. Um, we used to actually camp out when our sweet corn was just ready for harvest um, because the raccoons would wait until, you know, basically the day that they are the sweetest when you want to harvest them. Um, that's when they, you know, bring the whole family out. So we would camp out with the dog and uh, didn't have any problems. So scare tactics do work for the vertebrates. All right, now diseases, which a disease is kind of has a loose definition. It's basically anything that causes an abnormal growth or loss of plant vigor. Um, so we think of all kinds of different things that you know, some people might actually classify as a disease. Generally, I reserve the term disease for um, something that is caused by a living thing. So biotic versus abiotic or physiological issues. So we think, think of things like uh, lightning or hail or chemical burn or uh, too much or too little water, um, weed eater damage, whatever. All that injury is abiotic. Um, we'd also include in there nutrient deficiencies. Um, or toxicities. Um, that's not caused by a living thing. And because of that, I don't use it as a disease. Um, some other plant pest managers would call that a disease though. So disease is anything that causes suboptimal plant growth, um, but I'm going to also say caused by a pathogen. So caused by a living thing. So, separate abiotic from biotic in this case. So a biotic disease, anything caused by a pathogen. Um, abi abiotic issues are things that are like air pollutants, nutritional deficiencies, imbalances and toxicities, and just any issue that is not giving optimal growth. So you don't have enough light or you've got too much light don't have enough moisture, you have too much moisture, you have too high of temperatures. Um, these are things that can look like biotic diseases, but are caused by non-living things and therefore are not infectious and do not spread from plant to plant. Um, generally there, if you have an abiotic issue, it's somewhat uniform across an area of plants. Um, biotic issues are somewhat random. They're, the way that they progress, um, biotic issues are going to progress um, usually fairly um, rapidly and um, kind of sporadically as well. Abiotic issues a little bit more slowly and uniformly. All right, so plant pathogens include anything that causes a disease such as a virus, a bacteria, different kinds of plasmas, uh, also fungal-like organisms and fungi as well. Um, also things that just we can't see but might, you know, be included um, as an animal like nematodes and also um, parasitic plants as well. So all these things are plant pathogens that cause diseases and they can affect a wide variety of plants and plant tissues um, and have different signs and symptoms um, depending on and look different depending on what the variety of the crop is. So, um, you know, everything's different. The DNA kind of will affect the way it appears. Um, all plants are susceptible to attack by at least one pathogen in each of the groups that was listed above here. And some plants are susceptible to many of them. So we'll just give a, a general introduction here to um, plant diseases because we could have a whole class just on plant disease. So um, some of these have a broad range and some only attack a very specific um, species of crop. 
So there are three um, phases of pathogenesis, the development of a biotic disease. Um, and it starts with inoculation. And um, I kind of compare this to uh, if you've ever grown mushrooms before, you're, you're doing the same thing. You're inoculating um, the host with um, the pathogen itself. So you, inoculation is when it comes in contact with a susceptible host. And usually that's going to be entering through either a natural opening like the stomata or um, the lenticels on the bark of a tree, the pores, um, or through uh, penetration of a host by a wound um, or an insect. Um, the next phase is when it's establishing itself within the host, and that is known as incubation. So it's inoculated, and if we go back to the mushroom example, that incubation period is when the mycelium is actually spreading within whatever it is that we inoculated. Um, so you might not see that. It might be kind of under the surface of the plant or the host, um, but it's still there and it's spreading within it. So that's incubation. And then infection is when it's actually growing and reproducing within or outside of the host. And this is when you start to see um, actual symptoms and signs um, from the disease. And it's actually really negatively affecting it to the, the greatest extent. Um, from there, it can disseminate um, depending on what it does. If it's a fungi, it's gonna you know, produce spores and move um, and move to other plants potentially, as long as they are susceptible. So here's just a look at the disease cycle again, starting with inoculation, going inside the plant, becoming established and beginning to um, spread within it, um, kind of this incubation period. And then we get over here to growth and reproduction. That's when we have infection and when it's starting to move. And beyond that, we get dissemination and movement outside of the species. Um, I mentioned signs and symptoms, and it's important to distinguish between the two. A sign is um, actually the physical presence of the pathogen or the infection. Um, so I think a classic example of a sign, um, going back to our mushroom example, would be the fruiting body of the mushroom itself. So it's infected and it's begun to reproduce. Um, that is a sign, the organism itself. Um, a symptom is the plant's reaction to whatever it is that is affecting it, causing that disease or injury. So um, symptoms, I mean, signs and symptoms both can change as the disease progresses, but uh, symptoms change more. Um, so here are some signs and symptoms here. Um, could be just an abnormal color of the tissue of the plant itself. And we can see that on the leaves. Uh, we say it's chlorotic if it starts to turn yellowish. Um, it starts to turn brown, we call it necrotic. And necrotic is also just dying tissue. Or um, like pictured here, we've got a kind of a purpling um, or reddening of these corn seedlings. And this is usually due to um, nutrient deficiencies. Um, Abiotic issues most commonly cause um, abnormal tissue col uh, coloration, um, but we can also get mosaic and modeling patterns, and those are more associated with diseases, biotic issues. Um, we get wilting um, caused by a wide variety of fungi and bacteria, and it's the same thing. Of course, we have the abiotic issue of a lack of water that causes wilt or sometimes too much water. Generally wilting um, the organism is causing um, a disruption of the xylem. So it's, it's not allowing that water to be transported, which basically does the same thing. We also have just tissue death. Um, usually starts as spots um, and spreads to be the entire um, leaf, stem, or root, whatever it is, 
And we usually think of this as kind of a decay and like soft succulent tissue. Um, we can also have cankers, which is a big area of sunken dead tissue. And that's more often on woody plants. We can get defoliation that just causes the leaves to drop. Um, and that often is the plant's um, response to it, but of course also as the, the leaves die and themselves are gonna drop. So um, several things that can cause leaf drop or defoliation. Um, we can have kind of overgrowths or an abnormal increase in tissue size. And uh, these are often um, called galls, um, whether they're formed on the stem or the roots of the plant, um, kind of like a cancer. We can also get stunting or dwarfing. Or we could get, um, in this case, we have corn smut here, which is a, a fungus grown on it. It's actually, um, this is a delicacy in Mexico. Um, doesn't look very good, but it actually, it's pretty tasty. I have to admit, but corn smut, this is the fruiting body of the fungus. So this is like the mushroom growing on the corn. So in this case, we're getting replacement of the host plant tissue with the tissue of the infectious organism itself. Um, so talking about diseases and their kind of causal agents, the pathogens, um, we have viruses which are not living. Um, they are intracellular pathogenic particles. Um, generally, they are, are like little packets of DNA or RNA. Um, so viruses are not living and therefore we can't kill them. Um, so there are things that can disrupt the uh, membranes of viruses, but again, they're not living so that they don't die. Um, Soaps can disrupt the, the membrane, but um, nothing actually kills them. So the poster child virus for plants anyway is TMV or the tobacco mosaic virus. And it, it's the poster child because it was the first virus that was ever described. And if you guys work um, with tobacco, relatives of the tobacco plant, um, I'm just saying don't smoke. Or if you do smoke or use any tobacco products, wash your hands. Um, very thoroughly before coming in contact with them. Um, TMV is very common on tomatoes and peppers especially, um, but it can affect a wide variety of plants, um, some things outside of the, the tomato tobacco family. Um, so anyway, viruses cause all kinds of different things. Um, generally, they do require a wound in the plant for its initial inspiration. Uh, entrance because they can themselves cannot um, penetrate cell membranes of plants. Um, so once they're inside, they can infect cells, but they, they cannot actually penetrate the outside cell membrane. So usually there has to be a wound and usually they're transmitted by some sort of vector. Um, with tobacco mosaic virus though, that vector could be your fingers. Um, so generally, um, viruses don't completely kill the plant because they are feeding off of it. They need that plant, the host, to replicate. In very extreme cases, they can kill them, but it takes usually it takes a long time. Um, they do require a living host to be able to grow and multiply. So once infected, there's not much we can do um, about viruses on plants anyway. Um, so generally what we do is either plant a resistant variety, um, try to prevent the infection from ever happening, um, or we kill the plant once it's infected with the virus and we start to see signs and symptoms. Um, bacteria also cause diseases. And again, I'll say the same thing with insects. Most bacteria are actually beneficial. Um, most viruses are not, but most bacteria are. Um, so recognize that there's lots of good guys out there in the bacteria world. Um, downside of bacteria is there are lots of bad guys too, and they can multiply very quickly once they have the right environment. Generally, that's warm and moist. Fungi and also fungal-like organisms, which we call flows, 
um, cause more plant diseases than any other group of pathogens. Um, there are over 8,000 species of fungi and flows that um, cause plant diseases. Um, so those range from things like uh, damping off, which attacks and kills seedlings, kind of looks like rot, to any kind of rot. Um, most rots are caused by fungi or some bacteria too. Um, also downy mildew, all mildews are, are, most of them are caused by fungi. Most of the things that we had referred to as mold to mildews are in the fungi or flow kind of categorization. Um, they do have to have a hyphae to be classified and, and a collection of the hyphae, which is almost like a, a root hair for a fungi. Um, collectively, they call those mycelium. Um, yeah, so think of those kind of like the <coughs> roots of fungi. Um, here's a very common uh, fungus. I'm sure you've seen it in uh, the supermarket before. Um, very common for uh, post-harvest issues. This is gray mold or um, Botrytis cinerea. And you can kind of see this uh, filamentous mycelia uh, as it spreads. And that's the really light colored stuff is kind of the fruiting body of it that's going to grow the spores and spread it. Nematodes are um, actually closer to insects. They're um, simple, microscopic, but multicellular animals. Um, bacteria are unicellular, fungi are multicellular. Um, viruses are also pretty much unicellular, even though it's not really a cell. Um, nematodes look like little worms. Um, they are soft bodied, um, which separates them from other insects. Um, it's kind of like a tube inside of a tube, and these feed on both roots and leaves. Um, there are good nematodes and bad nematodes, um, and it basically depends on the mouth part that the nematode has. Um, so if it's a, a piercing mouth part called a stylet, which is the same thing that mosquitoes have, then it's a plant pathogen. It's got more of an open mouth than it's usually a predator, and, it, and actually it's a good guy. Um, so usually what we see in nematodes are um, things, root damage. So this is root knot. Um, looks like the roots are tied in knots. And um, that's just from an infection of nematodes on the roots. Um, we can see all kinds of things happen above ground um, to the plants when we get root knot as well. And they can look like diseases, which is why they are kind of mentioned in here with diseases. So whenever we have any kind of disorder, it could be any kind of pest, um, we have to first kind of spend a lot of time on the front end defining and determining what the problem is and that it actually truly is a problem. The best thing I can think of here to in determining, excuse me, determining problems is keeping good records of everything that you're doing to cultivate your crop and examining your entire um, plant community and looking at what are the optimal conditions and am I meeting those optimal parameters? Um, was there a, an odd weather event that occurred? Um, did I you know, go out and fertilize at the right time? Did I fertilize too much? Does the plant have enough water? Um, does it have enough air movement? Um, what's the wind like? You know, what, what's the slope of the land? You know, all of these factors kind of go into it. And again, the best thing you can do is know your crop, know what your crop is supposed to look like um, under ideal optimal conditions. And that will help you to be able to diagnose um, plant disorders the most, I think. Um, when we look at their being a potential problem, we want to see how that problem is. Is it progressing? Is it moving? Where is it going? Is it on one plant? Is it on a lot of plants? Is it just on a specific plant part? Or is it all over the plant? So we're looking here for patterns. What are the patterns that are occurring? Are there patterns occurring? And how are those patterns developing over time? 
Did it disappear overnight or did it take several weeks? Has it spread or has it stayed in the same location? Usually when we have progressive development spread over time, that's usually more caused by pathogens and insects. We have more sudden damage that does not spread. That's usually more abiotic. So we're gonna think of ourselves almost like journalists, you know, ask the who, what, when, where, why, how, how much. Um, take good notes, keep good records, gather that information and analyze it to determine the cause of the plant damage. Um, again, knowing your crop and that particular genetics of that crop and its kind of age, um, its maturity its, or juvenility um, and what it's supposed to look like in that stage of growth. What have you done? What are your cultural practices? What are the recent weather trends? Again, think of all of this and kind of take this holistic approach um, to identifying the pest before you ever take any action on it itself. And that wraps up our presentation here on um, integrated pest management. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, hope you all have a great weekend.